Hang on, let me just uh, stick this into full screen. Okay, well, today, guys, I'm joined by Stephen Murphy, BSC, ISC. Um, Stephen, where are you and uh, how, how are you keeping? I'm keeping very well, thank you. I am in London. I'm in North London. And uh, I've been... I've been in lockdown slightly longer than everyone else. We, I was on a job in the U.S. when when this all kicked off and we had to sort of escape from, from the U.S. And I went straight into the lockdown as soon as I got back, which is maybe like a week or two longer than the official U.K. lockdown. So, Right. So did you, were you, you were shooting out in the U.S. and uh, they kind of saw the travel ban looming yeah. over and yeah. sent you guys home. Right. Yeah, I was, I was shooting a feature for Netflix, and, and Netflix were really good. They had been keeping an eye on on everything, you know, very closely and updating the producers, you know, probably on an hourly basis. And we, um, so we sort of we were monitoring it pretty closely, and then uh, we got word that this travel ban was going to kick in, and uh, uh, we jumped on a plane and came home. So. <laughs> Yeah, skedaddled out. Yeah, no, good, good one. It's good that you got home and didn't get stuck in a yes. what looks like to be a very interesting place right now, the United States. Much better, much happier being at home. Yeah. So, so you you mainly work in kind of features, drama, kind of world. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I would say ninety percent of what I've done in the last three years has been TV drama, um, with a little bit of feature work and. Uh, I, I would imagine that's probably what I'll continue trying to do. You know, I'll try and do more features, um, but really, narrative is is what I'm. It's what I like. It's also what I'm known for. I'm not really, uh, I'm not really in the commercials world. Most of the directors I work with are all narrative focused. Um, so yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, how did you? Uh, what's the story of getting to that spot? Like, where did you? Were you were you an assistant, or did you kind of come up through a different way? What, what's your story? My story, um, yeah, I came up through the grade, sort of in a what's now probably an old school way, in that I started as a trainee and worked my way up. Um, I had a slightly unusual beginning in that I didn't go to film school to be a cinematographer. I went to an art school to do prosthetic makeup uh, because I had a I when I was younger and I still do now I paint and I sculpt and I make models I've got lots of very nerdy hobbies that I had when I was a kid and to me it seemed like that was the most uh that was the skill set that I could translate most easily into what you know to film um I had no technical background in terms of photography and barely taking any photographs you know we had a camera as a in the the family had a camera, a stills camera, but you know we weren't allowed to use it because we might break it, and it was an expensive thing. Um, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't until I got to this art college that we were encouraged to learn photography, uh, film photography, and um, particularly black and white photography and printing, so that we would understand what the lens is doing to the sculptures that were making or to the makeup that we're applying and things like that uh, yeah. and i got just fascinated with it uh and it just yeah the sort of photography bug bit me um yeah and then because the art school had a film school in it we would be on their film sets on the student sets to do makeup or effects and stuff and uh i got to see oh okay that's that's a camera crew and that looks quite fun, and uh, it just it just uh, sparked something in me. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so um, so I basically I spent two years in college. Uh, I was pretty young when I went there. I was maybe seventeen or eighteen when I got into art college. And um, was this was this in Ireland? This is in Ireland, yeah. Um, okay. And uh, during that time, maybe at six months or so into the college. I got a chance to go ahead and work on a film in that was shooting in Dublin at the time uh, called Space Truckers, the Stuart Gordon film that has um, Dennis Hopper in it and a, a sort of cheesy sci-fi movie. But they were building a huge amount of miniatures in Dublin 
for the VFX side of things, and I got to work with the miniatures crew. And uh, that again showed me there was motion control rigs all set up out in the miniature studio, and it sort of showed me another side of the business, which yeah. is really interesting. Um, but I basically continued then working, doing design work or prosthetics work while I was in college to help pay the bills. And by the time I finished college, I knew that I wanted to gravitate towards the camera department rather than be stuck in a studio um, painting and sculpting. So, right. uh, so then I literally just start tried to get work as a trainee, um, joined the union that Ireland had at the time. At the time, you sort of needed to be in the union in order to work. And they published a list of all the crew that were working. And so I would go cold call every single focus puller and clapper loader and uh, primo phones. So you'd be ringing them on the dial up phone and trying to get them to, you know, give you a chance as a trainee. And I started yeah, that yeah. and um, worked up from there. Nice, nice. I think, yeah, because I, 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 I rechecked your IMDb last night and uh, saw some, I saw some makeup prosthetic kind of in section on there. And I was like, oh, that's yeah. quite in There must be an interesting story behind that one. There's a, there's a little, it doesn't help that that's my background. There's also, there is a very experienced, very, very good prosthetic makeup artist whose name is Stephen Murphy, who <laughs> is more experienced than me, obviously. Um, you know, he has this long, long list of fabulous credits. Uh, and I get confused for him all the time. Um, <laughs> so constantly getting emails from makeup artists trying to show me their portfolios, thinking that I'd be in a position to hire them. But um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Maybe you, should, you could. Uh, at least you've got a second career to fall back on. You never know. You might uh, get yeah. into the prosthetics world again. I say on every job I do, I always tell the makeup artist. I go, you know, I was a makeup artist, and for some reason, no one believes me. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. I also saw on there that it said it said the West Wing. Is that yeah. so? That you, was you, the on the West. Yeah, so that was uh, so when I, w I had, was a trainee, I think I'd, I maybe had been a trainee a year or so, uh, the Irish government had received, they were having a sort of um, a boom in their, in the film industry because of the tax break they had introduced. They were getting a lot of American productions coming over and they instigated a training program for anybody in the country who was an assistant at the time who wants to take part in it, where they basically, um, they brought over an American DP, very famous commercials DP called Ron Dexter, uh, and a, a very experienced camera operator called Richard Walden, who'd been the operator on like Lethal Weapon and stuff like that, and a really, really brilliant focus puller called Heather Page, who had been on Armageddon and The Green Mile and done a bunch of Michael Bay movies. So they brought those three people over to teach us for six weeks um, sort of fundamentals in cinematography and operating and assisting with the notion being that we would be, we would make better assistance for the American crew and be more employable for the American crews coming over. And part of that training then meant that after our six week training period, they paid us to go and shadow a second AC on a show in the U S and I was put on the West wing. Uh, oh. Which, which was great. So, uh, you know, it's a big show. I think it was maybe halfway through season one. Um, and fortunately for me at the time, uh, the Steadicam operator, they had had a couple of Steadicam operators sort of come through the series. And the Steadicam operator um, called Don Thorne Jr., who's now a DP, he had just started. And he was, I was really keen to learn Steadicam. And he was more than happy to help teach me so it meant that uh kind of a couple of times a week he'd let me put on his rig and i would walk around the west wing sets <laughs> the steady cam and that became my first um sort of uh taste of steady cam and what it could be or what i could be you know with this oh, yeah. pursued that so it was great experience you great. any of those long dialogue corridor scenes Aaron yeah. saw can be they had, like, it was really interesting because they had their, it was quite eye-opening to see how it was set up. Because up until that point, any of the TV work that I had done was, you know, either UK stuff, BBC stuff that was shooting in Ireland or, yeah. or Irish, you know, indigenous stuff. And, you know, typically in the UK, uh, or traditionally, I should say, we 
productions tend to um, use locations more than they do sets. Whereas this experience of the West Wing was, you know, their whole logic was, well, we have all this dialogue, we need to keep it interesting, so we're going to keep the camera moving, uh, so we will build the set around that way of shooting. So on the West Wing, the vast majority of the sets were all one interconnected set. Wow. Uh, you could walk from one end of it to the other. Um, yeah. I think they were on two stages. We were in Warner Brothers. I think it was built across two stages that had opened up, and they built this huge set all the way across it. So you were walking around the ground floor of the White House, which is amazing. So you could do all those continuous shots. Yeah, yeah. Thought it out really cleverly. They had all of the playback monitors all hooked up to a single playback station in the corner of the studio um, that was all controlled, all remotely controlled. They were sort of ahead of us in our wireless thinking. They were using, I think they were using UHF transmitters at the time, so that all the key crew had wireless transmitters in their hand, just small little portable yeah. uh, monitors, um, so that they could judge the dressing of the background, judge the crosses and the white from the extras and it was just a really really well thought out system um and it blew my mind so i mean they would do like heavy page counts they would do six seven pages eight pages a day but with yeah. really interesting camera moves um because it just all worked six seven pages of one scene i guess yeah but, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great and then so then going from there doing that kind of you know assisting work in ireland and it, uh, do you, you live in you live in uh, England now, or do you, yeah. you still live yeah. in Ireland? No, no, I live in I live in London. I, I moved over here two thousand seven, okay. twelve, thirteen years ago. Um, so yeah, I spent um, I so so after I mean the West Wing was let's say very late nineties ninety nine or two thousand maybe, and um, so that was for a couple of months. Came back to Ireland, continued assisting. Um, uh, and, uh, you, you know, what I was doing, most of the work I was doing as assistant was commercials, actually. Um, right. But I'd end up going out doing multi-camera stuff on movies or TV things. And I did a couple of features, but I sort of fell into a groove of working in commercials uh, with a couple of focus pullers, which was great because it meant I could do three or four days a week, make the same money as somebody doing, or more money as somebody doing a TV drama or a movie. We had access to all the newest gear. I was kind of encountering a whole bunch of different DPs. I was super keen to light, but I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was shooting short at the time, you know, um, but I wasn't, certainly wouldn't have had the skill set to do, to move up to DP at that sort of level. So, um, but I was constantly trying to pick up what everyone around me was doing, figure out why that DP was doing this, why he was doing that. Um, so I did that for uh, quite a while. And an opportunity came up for me to buy a second-hand Steadicam rig in Dublin. So there was a company going out of business, and they were selling this rig. And at the time, there was nobody in Ireland doing Steadicam. So for production to do, to use a Steadicam operator was a big deal because they had to pay for someone to come from the UK, pay travel days, and it cost them a lot of money. And I thought, right, you know what, I could probably buy this rig, get it rebuilt. Um, there's a whole bunch of Steadicam companies just came out that were sort of doing modifications and custom yeah. stuff. But the sort of market had kind of expanded quite a bit and what you could get done. Uh, so I bought a rig and I started to learn how to operate. I went over to the States to Garrett Brown and uh, to Philadelphia to take one of his workshops. And then I started doing, still continued assisting, but I started doing, you know, I could do shorts as a second operator, you know, promos and stuff like that. I started to learn. And then eventually, basically around the time where I should have, I was beginning to get off of work as a focus puller. I was doing sort of B camera and I was doing, you know, dailies and stuff and commercials and promos. And at the time where I probably should have stepped up and gone, well, now I'm just going to be a focus puller. I said, well, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to just operate. And uh, went straight into Steadicam. And, uh, you know, after it was slow to begin with, but slowly but surely the word got around that I could, I was, you know, okay. Yeah. I got with a few jobs and then it just built from there and I got really busy really quickly and then I kind of continued doing a mix then of features and commercials and TV um, because again it's sort of the way the Irish budgets were set up they wouldn't budget unless it was a very big show they wouldn't budget for a full-time uh, steady cam operator so yeah. it was being on dailies 
and at the time it kind of worked out really well because it meant I could do I could have two or three features happening at the same time they sort of jiggle their schedules around to accommodate me a lot of the time because I would be saving them so much money in travel days that they weren't having to pay which meant I got to work across quite a lot of stuff and again see an awful lot of DPs working um, and I was an awful lot because I was a little bit you know further along in my career I was a bit more aware of what they were doing or they were a bit more learning experience for me further down the line excellent so then like jump forward to you know what was the what was the what was the thing that made you move to london and and, and make that step uh so then i was kind of at a point where um i was yeah i was i wouldn't say tired of being an operator but i was really itching to start lighting i had done a couple of, you know, I continued to shoot loads of shorts and, and stuff like that. Um, but I really wanted to start doing longer form stuff. Um, and I was kind of getting tired of being the guy who came out with the Steadicam and then would sit in the truck for half the day and then yeah. run around crazy for the second half of the day and do all that, right? Or so, just come out for the last shot. Exactly. Or, or <laughs> you know, I had plenty of those examples where I sat around for so many hours and then five minutes before a wrap, it's like, quick, get the steady come out. So, the, again, because of the way the work that was being produced in Dublin at the time, it's a, you know, Ireland is a, is, a, is a really good industry, but it's a very small industry. And yeah. um, there was a lot of really good DPs working there. And I didn't think I would be able to find my way into the, you know, into enough work as a DP um, over there. So I decided to give in London ago I knew it was a bigger market um, I, I you know really loved an awful lot of really sort of famous British DPs with their work I really idolised so I thought right let's go over here um, and I picked the worst possible time to move over uh, with hindsight um, what, kind of, what, kind of, what kind of time are we looking at when was this this was uh, this was 2007 halfway through 2007 right. and I went okay great I'm going to move over. I had a couple of really busy years as a steady game operator. I'd saved up a bunch of money. I figured yeah, if I go to London, it'll take me, you know, six months to get established. So, you know, I've got plenty of savings. It'll be fine. Um, we move over. I moved over with my girlfriend and uh, we, you know, sort of went out, tried to meet people, you know, met sort of a bunch of production companies and all that kind of stuff. And uh, people were like, yeah, we might start to take a chance on you. And then the economy fell through the floor and everything stopped, uh, yeah. which, you know, which is, which happens. So, so I sat around for a long time doing nothing or very little, uh, which was, which was a pain. But eventually I was able to work my way back in as stuff was starting to kick back off. Um, I started getting a chance to shoot like corporates and things like that. I okay. paid the bills for a little while and then corporates yeah. became promos and promos became commercials, not great commercials, but, you know, sort of bread and butter commercials. Um, and then I started getting, because all the drama guys that I would have known from operating, they started, uh, drama started picking back up again for them. And I started getting a chance to a uh, light second unit for a lot of them. Uh, yeah. And then that, that then became second unit dp for a while and then that became a chance to do main unit work nice nice and what kind of and that so that was kind of 07 and now looking when when did you feel like it kind of picked up was it was it a good couple of years or yeah it took a while i mean i would have said i mean in my head i would probably have written off, i would write off 08 so 07 because we moved like in the summertime so the second half of 07 was fine that was like you know that was the six months we said we were just moving, yeah. or, you know, and I went back to Ireland, you know, so I was still busy in Ireland. So I would go back and operate over there, you know, for movies and stuff with us, um, for dailies and things, which was fine. But I think 2008, I mean, I'd be surprised if I did like more than three or four days of work all of 2008. You know, yeah. it was, it was great, you know, um, but it was grim for a lot of people. It just didn't help that I had moved country, knew nobody. And was trying to was the new kid on the block basically, you know. Um, 
but then it's you know it then it starts to pick up and you know i mean the thing is stuff like that um happens uh, obviously we're all sitting in the middle of a downtime right now yeah when when i was an assistant there was certainly it the idea especially in ireland that you would have a bad year or not a bad year but you might have a quiet period of say three months or four months of that work was not that uncommon the idea that you go oh you know what you should have something put aside for the time when you know that movie falls through and you're sort of you know looking for work for a couple of years that that has sort of that idea is you know since 2008 or 2009 whatever it was um because it's been so busy especially over here there's an awful lot of people who haven't experienced that so which is i mean you know, yeah, i mean i i personally came into the industry myself in kind of like the back end of like oh eight oh like beginning of oh nine and it was kind of you know it was still slow but it was just recovering but obviously i had no anything to base it off of so it was fine for you know it was fine for me and then again yeah like you said it, from that point it's only got busier and busier for all of us but i can imagine and i i, I was working with guys who were telling me tales of like you said doing yeah. three days for, in a year or something like that like even guys who'd been really established in the industry and you know now people who came in kind of you know in the past three or four years or something they yeah they it's, it's, had this rosy rosy yeah. lifestyle yeah yeah you, you, sure. it, you should yeah. remember to save the save the rainy day fund yeah, absolutely it, it does it does it, it does happen and if it wasn't because of this obviously this is a completely different sort of scenario but there's in my head which is maybe the wrong attitude to have but i always think there is a version of that you know quiet time that's going to kick in at some point and it it's oh, yeah. you know and it again the other thing that was happening in 2008 roughly was there was um in the us there was the i want to say it was a writer's strike and an actor's strike back to back yeah it was, was yeah yeah sort of all combined into you know the roughly the same time period you know there is always the possibility that that will happen again you know like just a strike slows things down for a few months yeah. but it's a big industry it takes a lot of momentum to get it up and running and then when it's up and running it usually runs for quite a while so there yeah. there is you know moving forward there is always the possibility of you know a quiet yeah. month or you know it's, it's part of the quite funny because like with all this time i've been watching a lot of old shows again re-watching them and uh it's quite funny looking at their like the longer shows they've got these big huge chunks of like 24 episodes and then all of a sudden they go down to like eight episodes in one season or something it's just because everyone stopped writing and stopped working for <laughs> for a year but is there so do you feel like there was a is there a memorable point for you where it kind of clicked was there a, was there a particular job or a particular time where you kind of said you know where I feel like a lot of DPs have that kind of breakthrough, maybe moment where you feel, yeah, this is th there's a change, there's a change in the tides. Um, I would say, f funny enough, I don't think there's been one moment necessarily. I think, um, you know, I could there was definitely a moment when I was an assistant and I was like, you know, oh yeah, okay, now I'm getting regular work, or I know enough people that I'm not as worried about trying to find work that you know there's enough of a yeah. sort of circle of you know, contacts that something would come up. The same thing sort of happened when I stepped up to operating this, and then the same thing happened when I stepped up to, to lighting, whether there was, I don't think there was necessarily one sort of definitive job that unlocked other things, except maybe in terms of shooting main unit drama, where there was definitely a period for God, two, three years where I was getting put up for a lot of TV drama and uh, I, either I couldn't get in the room, which was the first, you know, for an interview, yeah. which is the first thing, or I'd get in the room and I'd do a great interview and I would be told, you just, the execs are worried about you making this schedule. And at some point then when I did get the first TV drama job that I got, the schedule thing just disappeared. And then it was like a floodgates opened and there was loads of drama work. Um, so the, there was that. I, I wouldn't necessarily equate it to like a big break. I think I'm probably still waiting for a big break. Um, but, uh, and I, I think, think we all, you're yeah, always waiting I, for a big break. Yeah, exactly. And I think even if I was doing like $100 million movies tomorrow, I would probably be waiting for the big break that got me the $200 million movies. So, 
something like that, you know. Um, Wait, the, that Marvel? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. what was that? What was that? That job that you that was like you, you had the interview and you actually got it. What was that first? Um, that was uh, it was a TV series called The Moonstone, which was like a five part series that the BBC were doing, and um, the only reason I got it is. Well, probably a few reasons I got it, but basically, it was a TV drama. It was a what do they call the slot? It was a daytime drama, so it was going out middle of the day, not in the evening. So it had a smaller budget, and obviously, it wasn't as cool or as desirable as like a prime time slot thing. But the director who was doing it was somebody that I had worked with uh, very briefly. I'd done it like a day second unit or something with her in Dublin. And I think this was her first job in the UK and she was coming over. She knew the budget was really tight. She knew it was, it was daytime, but she also, it was, it, you know, she knew there was sort of a creative kind of side to it that she could get into. And she just wanted somebody, she wanted a DP who could sort of go along that ride with her and, and bring something to the table for her. And she was ringing me thinking that I wouldn't want to do it, asking me if I knew someone younger that would do it or someone cheaper that would do it, right? And I kind of went, oh, look, I might do it. And um, he was like, oh, that's great. You, if you could, that'd be brilliant. Uh, so I sort of rationalized that if I did this, it would be a, you know, I didn't have to tell anybody that it was daytime. To me, it was a drama. And then yeah, yeah. we'd check a box for the executives. A stepping stone. Reviews. Yeah. So I did it. And um, the irony of it was that in terms of the schedule, the schedule was insane. We had to shoot 10 pages a day, minimum. Uh, yeah. because it was a daytime schedule and because it wasn't scheduled the way a drama was so I ended up doing going from being the guy who was you know too much of a risk because he hadn't done drama before because of the schedule to somebody who could work super fast and yeah, uh, yeah that kind of helped them you know uh, helped other execs take a chance on me in terms of drama and literally yeah, from that yeah. on there was no there was no question about like schedules it just seemed to disappear there was never a it was never a thing it was like i oh, know he's done one of them it's fine so. yeah i mean i think i guess it's that that, that age-old conundrum wasn't it that you know you haven't shot cars you haven't shot people you haven't shot a cucumber exactly. and then you shoot one cucumber and then you're now the cucumber guy do you know what exactly. i mean yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah and was there was there any particular was it to shoot that many pages every day in and out was it were you handheld all the time, or you just were you just rattling through it? Uh, not never. Or we did maybe a tiny bit of handheld, but essentially we shot the whole thing off of sticks and a slider because we couldn't afford a dolly and track, and we couldn't afford a grip. I should say <laughs> never mind the dolly and track. <laughs> so it was all done off of sticks. Um, so what we did was, uh, and this was sort of a useful exercise, and it came at the right probably time for me in in terms of what I was trying to do. Um, the director, Lisa, her name's Lisa Mulcahy, she's brilliant. And she used to be an AD. Uh, she's really, really good with cast, really good with crew, really good with schedules. And she's just very time aware. And she wants it to look good. Um, and she's also, you know, very pragmatic. She knows that your resource, resources are limited and your time is limited. So we would work quite closely together. And, you know, she, I sort of came up with a way of, trying to light the space more than the shot and okay. she's very very accommodating in terms of we walk into a room and if i say look this room is going to look the best from this angle here you know shooting towards the windows or shooting across the the, the light and um, she would go great you know she says this is what i'm trying to get out of the scene if you need to change the blocking so that the camera goes here and they flip around there no problem as long as the sort of dramatic intent is still the same and the narrative intent is still the same yeah. She really wants it to look good, and she really appreciates good-looking work. And if I can give that to her quickly by, you know, her compromising her, you know, where she thought the master shot would be, she's more than happy to do that. So we, we ended up having a really good collaboration, um, and that helped us get good-looking stuff uh, quickly, like super quickly. And I just sort of came up with a plan. I mean, I think on that job I had a gaffer and two sparks, and... Uh, uh, focus puller trap loader. I had to operate myself, no grips. And um, we just sort of had a clever way of working. It was almost entirely in one location, one big, it's a period piece. It was almost entirely one sort of uh, a big uh, house. 
and okay. we just tried to keep all the lights outside and just work cleverly inside um, yeah. and it worked mm -hmm. I mean, we had a great first AD everybody clicked everyone worked together it worked yeah keep keeping the floor clear i guess really helps to minimize that yeah. turnaround yeah yeah big time big time and that's kind of something that i've taken with me through everything else it's kind of become the the way i work um for the most part uh i, I now tend not to uh, i really resist putting lights on the floor if i can um yeah. and in some jobs you know uh when i did line of duty both seasons of Line of Duty, I, there isn't a single shot in Line of Duty where there's a light on the floor, it, like of the episodes that I've done. Everything is the lights are outside the set or in the ceiling of the set. Um, it's, it's it's just part of how I work. It's the same for, same for you know, I mean, the last show I've just done, uh, Hannah is a little bit different, but pretty much everything else. You know, um, I mean, if, you know, if I need to bring something in for close-ups, I will. But I just try and keep it. I try and keep the volume, the space lit, and I try and shoot towards the the light um, to get the best out of the set yeah. and the best out of them. And then it just means I have to I have to do less work for close-ups. Yeah. You know, I'm set, setting myself up to do less work for close-ups so that I can be quicker, so that I can give the director an extra two, three shots a day, or an extra couple of takes for a particular performance. You yeah. know, um, you'll get good looking material. I mean, that was going to definitely be another one of my questions for you is, you, you know, you've worked on quite a broad spectrum of um, productions from, you know, the BBC, Amazon mm -hmm. with Hannah and um, yeah. stuff in the States, like you mentioned recently, do, that that way of working, do you feel, do you, do you actually, do you take it to every production and does it, does it, um, does it ever, uh, I don't know, hinder like people, like producers, mentality of your work or oh well, i mean not not so far i think um you, know, you mentioned you mentioned so. with Hannah maybe something was slightly different but what was that was that down to just the nature of the work or was it due to the to the production no no that was more just to the nature of the work um yeah uh, and sort of the the quality i was going for um it, you know um but it, I mean, the difference between say what I did on Hannah and what I did on something else is more that the I might have had a slightly the, if I was using lights for close-ups, which I did on Hannah, I did all the time. I, there was a slightly um, it might have been a slightly larger source, or I wanted the light you know lower so that it would catch eyes a bit you know um, better than if I had the light in the ceiling. I'm sort of obsessed with top light. I love top light and. And it, it sounds terrible, but I, I am, I'm not, unless I'm absolutely told to, I am not interested in photographing actors. I'm interested in photographing stories. And to me, top light is a sort of nice, dramatic, I think most people look great in it. But, you know, on, on some, you know, jobs, you need to bring the light a little lower because you might want to see a bit more into someone's eyes. And on Hannah in particular, because um, Esme's got such expressive eyes and they're such a beautiful color, I really wanted to um, I really wanted to see those. So yeah. you know, so I would always have for a close up, I would always have a, a, a three quarter you know key light somewhere on the floor. Um, not always, but you know, some of the time. So it just meant I would be bringing in a little bit more. And that that was that was due mainly to you know feeling that expression in the eyes and not something that you felt came down from the top or was there ever any moments where you kind of started lighting like with all these top lights and then there was a message that came down do you know what i mean a memo yeah. that... no no i'm i've been quite fortunate in that i um i think i've only been told once that stuff was too dark or too moody and that was on a drama I won't name the names, but there was yeah. a particular, the leading actor was, uh, had quite a lot of clout and deferred a lot of that decision making about how they looked to their makeup artist. And in a particular case, it was my second day, the makeup artist decided that she didn't want this actor to be photographed in profile. and even though the direct, it was a beautiful profile and everybody looked great, 
um, they felt it was unflattering. And that really upset the director, and it really upset me because it was a lovely shot that the director really wanted. Um, and I was given a slap on the wrist because whatever the makeup artist said goes, and we had to change the shot. We subsequently, a week later, when everyone trusted us a little bit more, ended up doing the exact same shot in a different location and a different set. <laughs> and uh, I think we said, but other than that, by and large, I've I've not had any circumstances where I've been told the rushes are too dark or, you know, uh, the rushes are, you know, we need to see their eyes more or whatever. You might get like a few notes in the grade where somebody goes, oh, can we see a tiny bit more in like in, the, in an eye there or, you know, that kind of thing. That's a, there's, there's been no sort of significant alterations to my, to the original sort of photographic test at, at any point, which has been good because some of the stuff I do does get quite, dark especially for tv um but yeah. I, I quite like that yeah excellent so uh, your work on line of duty obviously that was a, like a hugely popular you know tv show i mean it, and it came into kind of like that last season kind of came into like huge kind of big cult following like it exploded massively do you know what i mean yeah and you did you did uh the last that last season and was it the season before the last I did uh, yeah, the last season of season five. I did all of season five and I did the last three episodes of season four. Uh, so season four, I took over. Uh, they had a, the way they structure there or the way they structured it that year, they had uh, a director to do episodes one to three and a director to do episodes um, four to six. And there was a sort of a, a break in the, in the shooting uh, block. There was like a week's break or something. Mm. And um, I came over during that break quite sort of at the last minute and um, uh, to do four to six. So in that case, we were, you know, obviously it had been established, the um, the look of that season had sort of been established uh, up front, uh, certainly the look of the, um, the police station, you know, their main headquarters. Um, so I I made a change, uh, you know, lighting change. I basically up until that point, they weren't using a huge amount of practicals, and all of the lights were on the floor, from what I gather. And I and it it, it meant that they struggled to get the volume of shots that they wanted, um, yeah. because a lot of the environments, especially in the police station sets, are covered in glass. And there are layers of glass, and it's a reflection nightmare. Um, and part of the show, part of the style of the show um, at that point, because the style of the show has changed quite significantly from season one to wherever it is now. But that year, um, the sort of the desire was uh, to create a sense of motion and energy through the cut more than through the camera. So you know, we so the. They really wanted a lot of shots to try and make that work. So I went into that um, set and I basically said, don't want to see any lights on the floor. I had a chat with the gaffer, Carlo, is a fabulous gaffer in Belfast, and he's brilliant. And I just said, look, uh, what, are, what, what have the problems been so far? And he kind of talked through the, what they had been doing and the issues they were having with it. I said, okay, let's take away all the lights from the floor. Let's put every lights in the ceiling. I want everything topless. The story had sort of taken a darker twist at the end of episode three. So yeah. I was using that as a license. I think um, Martin McCann's character had been sort of left for dead and it had gotten quite dark then from four onwards. And I went, right, I'm going to embrace this. Everything goes in the ceiling or goes outside the windows. And all we're having to do is black the reflections of the camera, which is a bit more man manageable. Yeah. It's all shot with two cameras, at least sometimes with three cameras. So in, in the particular case of this police station, the interview room is a glass box uh, with glass walls on three, two sides. It's in a bigger set, bigger location, which also has glass all along one side of the wall and has gla another glass office at the other end of the wall. Then has a glass trim that runs on the opposite wall. So you're literally surrounded almost entirely by glass. So it's a really tricky location to shoot. Um, so that moving all the lights in the ceiling became the solution to us getting the quality that I, I wanted in terms of the mood and helping us be efficient enough to give them the volume of shots they wanted. Um, and then I sort of took the the non-police scenes into a darker yeah. sort of 
your place as well. Um, and everybody loved us. So when it came time to do season five, the last season, uh, they asked me back and the director that I had worked with on my episodes had been asked back as well because basically they liked the, the dynamic that we had and they liked the, the, the style. And that director has an editorial background. Um, and they brought the same editor back as well. And we just worked, you know, we knew how to do that version of the show quite well. Uh, so then for the last season, again, I kept the same approach, all the lights were to the ceiling, uh, or they all went above actors. Um, if we were outside and we were doing street scenes, I would have like China balls or quasar tubes on genie booms that would come up and over as a soft top light. So everyone was always in like a pool of light. They're walking in and out of pools of light. Um, and that, yeah, that was it. I think, you know, we, I, I'm nearly sure, Carl will probably tell me, correct me, but I'm nearly sure we never, certainly never remember putting up like a classic three quarter key yeah. light for anybody. You know, it's not about sort of trying to beautify anyone or be pretty, you know, it's, it's all about this mood and this atmosphere. Um, and then it, you know, I could add more color to it last year as well, because there was a, they have their secondary story thread, which is the sort of the guest role. So Stephen Graham's role, yeah, who you know he's in it's he's in a different world and he's in the sort of bad guys world, and we could give that it's a different look and bring a lot more industrial sort of resources in, and um, yeah, it kind of it kind of worked. Did you keep the the so the practicals and kind of ceiling lights that you used in the in the police set, station set was that? Um, was that LED fixtures or was it a kind of original practical fluorescence? What did you go uh, for there? That is a great question. So if we go, because I can't remember on season four, but season five, yeah. we, they were not LED, they were fluorescent tubes and Carlos swapped out all the tubes. So I don't know if it's obvious on the show, but in the police station, Basically, Line of Duty is a locations-based show. They, they really like the authenticity of being on a location. And yeah. uh, so that police station, which was a different location to every year it had been in beforehand, is in a building that is 14 stories high. Um, cool. Of course, uh, which means that we can't light from outside, even if well, I had a lot, or if I had all the money in the world, I'm sure I could, but <laughs> we don't, uh, so we couldn't. Um, and it shoots in or well the year i shot it the two years i shot it it shoots from october to the end of to, to christmas so in belfast so you tend to lose the light in the in november and december at about lunchtime <laughs> which is tricky and the that particular location every single window had um this uh ND, the equivalent of ND6 on all of the windows all the way around the building. And we always saw the windows no matter where you looked. So we replaced all the lights in the ceiling with fluorescent tubes. Uh, or did we? We replaced some of them with fluorescent tubes. But we also... No, do you know what? That's not true. That was what we did in season four. Season five, we got um, consumer LED tiles. Okay. Um, one by one tiles you could swap out on the ceiling right and yeah. um, we got a whole bunch of those we bought them and we would put them in the ceilings and carlo had them all wired up uh, and we could you know unplug them move them where we wanted to and we could also uh, you know if we knew that an actor was going to land here and there was no led tile there we could just pull the tiles out everything was fed with cable we could put a yeah. keynote up there an led keynote whatever we wanted to match what we were doing with the the um the consumer tiles um and in addition to doing that, what we had to do was we, our schedule dictated that we needed to shoot day scenes or after lunchtime, after we'd lost the lights, and sometimes needed to shoot night scenes during the day, which was hard. So what we ended up doing was building window frames for every single window on the floor that were divided up into sections that were one by one so that we could take the tiles from the ceiling and put those in. So a window, if you looked at it, would look like it was, a, you know, a six window frame with a tile in them that when we, we and all the windows had um, blinds on them, when the blind was pulled down and the, and the lights were on, it just looked like the sun coming through the window. 
And that yeah. was all self-contained unit that was pre-built. So we could literally plug that right into the existing window and wire it up, which took a couple of minutes, and you'd yeah. have a, a sunlit window. Um, so that basically we could turn our, we could relight the whole set in about 40 minutes by doing all these window plugs all the way around and you never know the difference. Uh, yeah. So it works brilliantly. So we ended up for the police station having plugs in all the windows if it was nighttime. If it wasn't nighttime, we'd just pull those out and we'd just have the lights in the ceiling. We'd have the lights in the ceiling for nighttime as well. We had a particular rig built into the main interview room, uh, which I think I kept as Kino flows in the end, which was sort of eight foot tubes, uh, again, built in the ceiling and through perspex that we then frosted to match the, the practical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we had one light on a stand, a HMI in the deep background uh, to light a particular corner of the set. And that was it. So it would mean that you could do, you'd look at a rehearsal, you go, okay, they're going to start here and go over there. Are they going to stand under a pool of light? No. Okay, let's add a pool of light there, pull those tiles down. Within five minutes, it would be lit. And we would be adding blacks and negative fill for yeah. contrast and for reflections. And that was it. So the cameras could cross shoot a lot of the time. Yeah. Shot could develop. You could, one camera could pan somebody 180 degrees around, sit them at a table, while another ca camera picked up a different character and you do that. And it yeah. became super I mean, efficient. Yeah, I guess. And then it gives you, you know, I, th I think that's the one thing I always say to producers myself is that, you know, don't give me more money or more lights or more camera. I just want more time. Do you know what I mean? And if you can give yourself more time to, carefully think out those shots and that yeah. composition yeah. then you know it's yeah. it's it's it you know it, it's invaluable priceless you know more time uh, uh, time is the th time is the argument that i make every time i go into a job and you're planning a whatever sequence or you're planning a set uh, you know if i'm putting in a big list of machinery or a big list of kits and the producers are going, Jesus, this, do you really need all this stuff? The main argument back is, yes, because I will save you time. And I'm very responsible about that, about saving them time. You know, it's it's more, for me, or, and usually for most productions, it's more cost-effective to have multiple directions, you know, uh, pre-lit or yeah. rig so that you can switch lights on and off and you're not waiting for us to move lights around and we can be more time efficient than it is for you to stand around and watch us yeah, move lights, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and especially, especially on scale, on on um, on Hannah. Last year we did a night exterior, where again for a variety of reasons the schedule meant that we were on this. We needed to be basically in three locations in the same night that were on this huge. Um, plot of private land um uh and when we worked out you know we we basically didn't have the time because it was peak summertime so our night hours we only had maybe four or five hours of night mm -hmm. we didn't have the time to move machines no matter how quick they were we just didn't have the time yeah so when i worked out how to light the three night large night exteriors all at the same time so that we could literally walk from one end of the park to the other end of the park the list of machinery and equipment and rigging time and cables was massive, but the producers were smart. They went, great, let's go for it. And it meant we got the night and we wouldn't have made it any other way. Yeah. By getting the night done in one night and not needing to bring the entire crew back for a second night, they ended up saving money. So oh, it's, yeah. you know, the it, time is always the thing you're, you're trying to save. It's the most expensive yeah, thing. Yeah. I mean, I had a, 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 a gaffer, of mine always says the thing that you know he he sends a list in to a producer and they come back saying well do you do you need all of this do you need all these lights and often you know he'll say well you know to be honest yeah we do because you're going to still pay me the same amount of money if i put a redhead up or if i put these three 18ks up it doesn't make any difference to me this is what we need you yeah. know what i mean and this is going to make us get what you want in yeah. the time that you're giving us yeah yeah i mean so so much of the solutions that we present uh you know, aesthetics aside, are based on the schedule that we're presented yeah. with. And, you know, schedules are certainly in TV drama land anyway, and features, schedules are not getting 
any easier. Um, you know, they're they're getting more complicated. Uh, there's more moving parts uh, in terms of maybe actors, you know, availability or location availability or you know stuff like that. So, it, so trying to fit into the window that we have to yeah. shoot is part of the job and and still achieve the aesthetics of it that we want you know um and uh yeah and it's, it's you know it can be a fun part of the job it's a fun part of the puzzle to figure out i mean do you feel that uh, obviously the, the, you know the uk tv market or that the world's tv market in general is you know, expanding hugely you know there's netflix now amazon hbo have, have just built studios here the money that's going into tv projects is obviously going up do you yeah. feel like you just said do you feel like though that is do you think it's changing the industry or do you feel like it's just you know more money more problems uh no not necessarily i mean i think uh i would certainly think it, it's changing for the better you know i think yeah. we're getting to do there's no doubt we're we're doing feature film quality work you know in every department on tv drama schedules and budgets um and that's because the TV drama budgets are going up because the ambitions of the scripts are going up uh, and the ambitions of the scripts can go up because, you know, the audience is demanding, you know, you know, better and better. And, yeah. and you know, people are responding to that. So I, I personally, I think the work that we're getting to do for, for Netflix and Amazon and places like that is, it's like really interesting, really exciting. And yeah. as a consumer, I love the fact that I can watch, you know, a much higher level of, yeah. you know, TV work for the most part. I mean, you know, not everything is brilliant, but I think definitely driving the industry uh, in the right direction, uh, the TV industry in the right direction. I think yeah. the one complaint I'd have is it seems like it's, you know, we all know that they don't, the, the amount of sort of small and medium budget features getting made is, you know, has dropped significantly over the last few years. It's a pity that that's, seems to be you know happening sort of um it's a pity that people are connecting tv drama budgets going up to less and less movies right. really i would like to see more of you know really good tv drama and more small and middle budget movie and you know film. yeah yeah so um but I, you know, I definitely think it's good i think it's good for the industry good and i'd love to talk about um the favorite I mean, I know that you you went in and you you shot a couple of scenes or a, a couple of days yeah. for Robbie on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just explain like how that came about and, and uh, what it was like. Oh well, unfortunately, it came about because Robbie had a, a death in the family uh, unexpectedly, and um, he so obviously he, he needed to take some time off. Um, it, and it was it was very quick. Uh, I got a phone call. I was on a God, I think I was on a music promo or or something, and I got a phone call on a Monday night saying, "Can you come? Can you be here tomorrow morning?" Uh, and I just took over for the rest of the week. Uh, I think it was their second week. Um, it was it was you know, like I said, it was unfortunate, very unfortunate for Robbie. Um, yeah. It was for me, you know, I had a, it was a great experience. Um, it was a really nice production. It was, you know, it's great movie, really great director, and to be honest, Robbie had set it up in such a way that it was you know, it, it, easy for me to sort of step in and take over, you know? Yeah. Um, was it very, even even on the second week, was it, or it was already very set, I guess, you know, a feature like that already has the, the kind of look and the feel and the nature of it. Yeah, they had done, they had, I think, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that we, my week, uh, certainly my first day, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. was their first night shoot. So they hadn't done any, night work yet i think i ended up doing all the nights in the movie um because i don't think there's very many of them um so you can that have night, thing, night, night exterior unit i could have that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but because the way they were working you know they hadn't sort of say and solved what they were going to do for night exteriors right. because obviously they didn't uh you know yorgo has this thing about uh not liking artificial light or you know preferring to try and do things with with natural light sources if you yeah. can um so robbie had a plan for how to treat the night exteriors you know in that he it was a you know again a large sort of stately home and he had light sources placed 
you know, to be turned on or turned off as needed, sort of around around the um, the area. We had a whole bunch of Wendy's and stuff, and um, or Dino's or something. We also had a mix of balloons uh, ready to go uh, again if we needed them. And uh, what we ended up doing was it was too windy to use the balloons, so they all automatically had to go. So then I was shitting myself, going, "Okay, um, we've got." the dinos and Yorgo was like really don't want to use those it looks too like this when you turn them on and you know he's right it looks yeah it looks like movie you know lights right so uh we ended up uh luckily the art department had dressed all these really beautiful um flambos uh, you know along this yeah. the path that the actors are going to take and uh and in, in all of the locations, I think I did another night exterior the next night in the courtyard or something. Again, those flambos, you know, they they had thought about. Yeah, how... I can remember Is that the one where they're getting into the coach. Yes. And, the, yeah. and you can see them and they, you know, they're just picking out the distance. Do you know right. what I mean? Giving you some kind of depth. Yeah. And that's and then it just drops off because that's what would have happened because yeah, yeah. they wouldn't have lined the streets with, you know, <laughs> flambo. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we just use that. We use a little bit of artificial light. Um, like, I mean, I think, I think we, whatever we had, I think I had maybe a couple of half Wendy's or a couple of three quarter Wendy's um, in each corner of, of the location. Yeah. And they were all switched off except for one. And on the one that was on, I, God, I would nearly even say I had it down to maybe like two or three bubbles, which is like two park hands. You know, it yeah. was really, 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 um, I mean, my light meter just said, you know, go home. And uh, <laughs> well, but, it, the whole thing was 35 mil, wasn't it? So uh, it was all 35, yeah. It was 35 mil that was pushed to one stop for the night exteriors and night interiors. So, uh, on the night interiors, um, and we were using Primo primes and we also had the P vintage lenses. So, the Primos go to one nine, but the P vintage, some of them will go to T2, some of them will go to I mean, 50 mil goes to T1, doesn't it? Yeah, yes, it is. Yeah. Anyway, um, but I was a little reluctant to use. Because everything was pretty much the primos, the P vintage were there just in case. Yeah. And because it was week two, and I wasn't sure how much Robbie had wanted to use the P vintage, I don't think I used them. I think I stayed with the primos. Okay. Um, I didn't want to stitch them up, you know. So when we did any of the interiors, they had already sort of engineered these um, because again, there's no lights in the interiors for the, for the night interiors. It's you know, there's candles everywhere. Yeah. In and then the gaffer had made up a whole bunch of um, sort of trays with uh, with reflectors. Um, so you'd have like a tray of candles here, and then a silver reflector or white reflector out of carved just around it. We'd stick that on a stand, and those would move around okay. at our lights yeah. and hide them. I mean, I'd, I'd use them like I'd use covered wagons. I'd say take it off the stand and stick it there behind the bed, or stick it behind the couch, or yeah. you know, just so you have some separation that way. Um, and it worked, you know, right. beautiful. Right. Like this stuff is great. But your your meter was still saying, "Oh yeah, so you said it while yeah, yeah." Just yeah. and I think I mean it's um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that you know works in your favor with that kind of scenario. One of which is actually that you're shooting on 35. It's uh, if you're shooting the same scene on on Alexa or Sony Venice, whatever. To my eye, the not clipping is the wrong word, but the way the highlights roll off on a digital camera on any of the digital cameras currently available compared to how the highlights roll off, you know, on film is not as pleasing. So, and you really appreciate that when you're doing these low light candle scenes. So everyone talks about like, you know, digital is great for low light and it's no question. It's brilliant. But actually I found the opposite was true in that scenario because it was all lit by candles where the, the candles are so present. The light sources are so present yeah. that to retain all the detail is really important. And um, in addition to all the other lovely kind of color quality that you get from shooting on film and the skin tones that you get, really the, the visibility of so many candles was, you know, I'm so glad we were shooting on film. We weren't on you digital. Retain that, that pinpoint detail in the middle of that, that flame. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, and then, you know, you're, you know, I mean, I'd be metering with my instant meter and by using my spot meter and stuff. And you come to appreciate then the fact that, you know, Emma Stone's skin is like beautiful. It's porcelain. Yeah. So it, so even though she's three and a half stops underexposed, 
she doesn't read that way you know yeah Uh, you know and the same for for rachel you know her her skin is gorgeous and it's you know a couple of stops you know lighter than everything else is going to be in the room so it helps you get some read even though it's a very dark wood set and the dark wood is soaking up all that light and behind the camera you know we're we've got all these uh, candles everywhere you know and it's it's, it's (laughs) extremely light I don't know. How, I don't know how Robbie treated them, but you're treated. But I, that's what I did for the yeah, yeah. for a lot of the stuff he was doing. So I mean, um, watching it, there's that scene in the in the library when she's trying to escape. And, that's one of the shot. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, well, you know, that it's a night. You'd think that it would just fall off to black, but there is still all that that detail in there. Detail. You know? Yeah, yeah. It was to me. I because it had been a, quite a while since I shot film and. I was just, I would see the dailies, I would go, God, this is great. This is yeah. like, why, why aren't we all doing this? Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is really good. So, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Hopefully, yeah, exactly. Great. Well, thanks so much for, for your time. I mean, I'd love to just, um, just finish up with like, what have you got coming up? I mean, obviously, we're all still in lockdown. There's been like some kind of discussion of us going back to work maybe one time yeah. or another. But I mean, is yeah. that, is your Netflix feature still in the running or do you, or are you yeah. still? Yeah, no, I mean, I've got, um, so I've got Hannah coming out in July. That's the next thing I spent the second half of last year shooting that. Yeah. And we got that finished, I think in February and then that comes out in 3rd of July. And then I went straight on to this year, the beginning of this year, went straight on to prepping this feature for Netflix. Uh, which is which it primarily is going to shoot in Bucharest. It's set in the US and right. haunt, basically it's a haunted house movie. So we're building the haunted house in Bucharest. Um, but we always wanted to shoot our exteriors in the US. So we had been in Cleveland uh, shooting, uh, like we were saying, uh, we, I think we had a week or you know, six days to do in, in Cleveland and halfway through that we got shut down. Right. But uh, because the sets are mostly built in studio in Bucharest. We've done most of our prep over there. Um, we're kind of, we're actually ready to go. Yeah. We, you know, we've got, we pretty much had most of what we needed from the US. I think what we'll probably do now is maybe look at building a couple of more, there's one or two US interiors that we might now build in Bucharest to see. Um, but we're sort of, you know, having discussions with how we would go back to work yeah you know when when we go back to work is still sort of open for discussion but um i think there's a lot of you know the bafc guidelines are you know coming out in a couple of weeks time and you know there's been a bunch of companies that have sort of issued their working guidelines and i think people are beginning to you know formulate a a way back yeah Um, so we're sort of having those discussions but i think we will be Fortunately, we'll probably be one of the. F- we'll be in a position to certainly go back quicker than most. Yeah, because yeah. we're set up and ready. So. Excellent, excellent. No, good news. Good news, and it's great to, you know, hear some rays of hope that yeah. we'll all go back to normal one day. Yeah, one day. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Stephen. It's, right. you know, it's it was insightful, amazing. You know, just to hear some of your stories, and really, really appreciate your time. Cool. No worries. Cool. And well, speak soon and cheers. Uh, hope, hope it all goes back to normal soon. Yeah, me too. Cheers, Joe. Thanks, man. Cheers, Steve.